Okay, super. So we're we're delighted to have George here again to speak with us. I I personally loved uh, last week's talk where, you know, really we saw for the first time in I don't know how many years uh, the resolution to the mystery of why first order viscous relativistic hydrodynamics had uh, superluminal information propagation speed. Um, and now I think we're going to see the application of that advance into even more interesting uh, practical applications. So George, when you're ready, please take it away. Okay, very good. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, this is now the second opportunity to talk about this. As Will said, uh, the first talk was just really to sort of explain some of the ideas and notation and things like that. So today, uh, it's more like a proper talk. You'll see it's a PowerPoint talk, but uh, please feel free to ask me whatever you need and want. Um, I'm very happy to talk about this. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about relativistic fluid. So I didn't talk about real uh, relativistic things last time. And I'll tell you how the new understanding that we have obtained about relativistic fluid dynamics can be used um, to describe uh, experiments and you know data from particle colliders um, going all the way to neutron star murder. So that's the, the point of this talk. Um, so let's go for it. So um, one thing that you see, of course, the fluid dynamics is everywhere. And when I say everywhere, it's really everywhere. It's like in a very, very vast, that vastly different scales in the universe. It starts from the cosmological scale when people do dark matter simulations at very, very large scales sent to the 27th, going all the way down, for example, to supermassive black holes like the one in our galaxy in Sag A star. This is like 10 to the 10 meters. People use fluid dynamics to describe or you know, plasma dynamics to describe what happens close to this black hole. Going down to neutron star mergers, you know, reducing this a little bit in size, um, we have now fluid dynamics in, uh, in, in interacting with general relativity, so very strong gravitational and electromagnetic fields. And of course, going all the way to a human scale where we normally understand and started to think about uh, the dynamics of fluids more than 2,000 years ago. So one question that you may wonder is, why are fluids so ubiquitous in nature? Um, there are many ways to answer this one. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yeah, OK. So one of the ways that I, I want to answer that I like a lot, uh, it was from uh, Goldenfeld and Kahnenhoff, where they say that nature can produce complex structures even in simple situations and can obey simple laws even in complex situations. So I think this, you'll see, it's uh, sort of like the whole theme of this area. And I think this summarizes very nicely what we think about it. So why are flu fluids so ubiquitous in nature? Well, at first, as we saw last week, the very first thing is that they come from very general conservation laws, right? So for example, uh, we talked about last time about energy conservation, momentum conservation in that context, in the context of non-relativistic physics, also mass conservation, whatever comes through some volume here, because mass is not really destroyed, has to go through some other place somewhere else at uh, later times. So and another part that was very important, this is the part that somehow gave a structure and started to help you to define your effective theory, how you describe fluids was the idea of locality. And by locality I hear, I mean, for example, imagine that this is a gas, right? These things are colliding. Of course, the microscopic scale is very tiny. It's of the size of the mean free path for these uh, little particles in this gas. Um, but the point is that we don't want to describe everything that is going on with this gas, right? We want to describe microscopic things. We want to describe things related to conserved quantities like energy and momentum and things like that. So that's the idea of coarse graining and the difference and the idea of separation of scale. So that's what I mean here. It's very important to have some well-defined separation of scales, at least theoretically, to understand what you're doing. And what happens is you have some micro scale, this little L here, and you have some macroscopic scale. So in this drawing, it'll be the scale associated with the gradients of energy and flow around this car here. This is a simulation, actually a super realistic simulation of the, the wind uh, going here with the car moving. And here the scale, the large scale is like 10 to the minus two meters. And one nice, little quantity that you can compute to estimate whether you see something that looks like a fluid is called this Knudsen number. And it's basically the ratio between the small to the large. 
when this thing is very, very small, and this ratio is very, very small, we normally associate that kind of motion to fluid motion. Okay, so that we, that's what I call hydro or fluid. Now, what I'm talking about today is not really just that. We borrow those ideas, but now we are going to the frontier. What could be the weirdest, the most extreme thing that you can do with this idea? And when you go to the frontier of fluid, uh, fluid dynamics behavior, would for example, be when you redefine your microscope, the stuff that is supposed to be big, you make it very, very tiny of the size, the size that are relevant for nuclear and particle physics. For example, we're not even talking about the atom anymore. We're going further to scales that are even the size of a nucleus or even smaller. Could even a proton itself behave like a fluid? So now we're talking about 10 to the minus 15 meters. Okay, so those are the questions that we're interested in. And on the other hand, when you go not from very, very tiny, but very, very large, uh, we also consider fluid dynamics under very strong conditions or extreme conditions. Um, for example, this a very strong gravitational field and very strong electromagnetic fields that you would find in neutron star mergers, for example, or in astrophysical plasmas near supermassive black holes like the one in our galaxy. So those are the type of frontiers that we're interested in in this talk. There are, of course, many fundamental questions that we can address. And they all have very well-defined uh, experimental applications. That's the most amazing part. But for example, one fundamental question is, how does relativistic fluid dynamics systematically emerge as an effective description of a quantum field theory? And what is its regime of applicability? How does relativity itself, just the fact that information cannot propagate faster than the speed of light. How does that constrain how quantum many body systems can dissipate? How that constrains how entropy can be created? Another question, and this is actually very interesting if you consider now what happens in neutron star mergers, how does one dynamically describe how entropy is produced during you know, a merger of neutron stars or even during gravitational collapse? In order to answer these questions, one fundamental thing that we still need to work on, and I, that will be the topic of this talk, is the necessity or the need to derive a consistent framework to investigate viscous fluids in relativity. So it will help to answer some of these questions and also hopefully bring new questions to, in the future. So let's start with the frontier of the very small, okay? So that has to do with heavy ion collisions. And this is basically what heavy ion collisions do. You may have heard this many times already from Will, but let me go through this uh, still very quickly here. Um, the whole point is the following. So you start with nuclei. Um, so these will be these parts here. They look like little pancakes because these things are going with the speed very close to the speed of light. So as they collide, they form something. Um, this is called in the field, some pre-equilibrium phase, a complicated system. Um, but the important part is that at this point in the collision, the degrees of freedom are not the original hadrons that were there before, the protons and the neutrons. Those are new emergent degrees of freedom that come as you disturb the vacuum and put so much energy in such small part that the effective temperature is so large that quarks and gluons become the real dynamical degrees of freedom of your system. Um, and that's what we call the quark gluon plasma is this quark gluon plasma phase here. The typical size of this thing is, you know, for example, for large nuclei, it will be of the order of 10 Fermi. And of course, a Fermi is more or less the size of a proton. The temperatures are very, very large. They are order of, of, orders of magnitude larger than the largest temperature in the sun. The time scale, so this thing lives for a very, very short amount of time uh, of the order of, uh, uh, of 10, more or less, for a large system or more Fermi over C. And Fermi over C, just to remember, just for you to remember, it's just the amount of time that it takes for light to go across a proton, more or less. And this system produces many, many, many particles as it, as, as it does here. So you see, this thing is produced, it's very, very hot. It expands in space. As it expands in space, like any other decent thing in the universe, it cools down. As it cools down, it goes back. At some point, there is a transition to the original degrees of freedom that were here. Now those are the hadrons that are produced. And those are the things that are eventually measured by experiments at the Large Hadron Collider and also at RIC in New York. Um, 
And this is how we study QCD, um, not in equilibrium, but actually we understand with this, we try to understand what happens to QCD at finite temperature and density and how it can actually equilibrate or not. Maybe the system is very far from equilibrium, we'll see. So um, in order to describe this uh, quark one plasma description, precisely this part where the system is still very hot, quarks and gluons are the degrees of freedom, the relevant degrees of freedom of your system. Um, the idea is that this is described using a fluid. So that's the, the, the standard hypothesis. Uh, and basically the, the, the point is that this system is expanding, it's expanding very, very close to the speed of light. So if this is a fluid, it's a relativistic fluid. So it is fundamental to use, to unite relativity and fluid dynamics in this description. And over the years, so this going back to uh, almost uh, 40 to 50 years, I would say, um, there were several developments uh, towards understanding hydrodynamics, uh, especially in the, in the applications uh, related to the quark one plasma and heavy ion collisions. And currently, um, most of, I would say, the vast majority of the simulations that you see, I'm going to show a little simulation here. I think that works. Let's see. Does it work? Yes. So this is just a little simulation of what the energy density looks like. So you see this thing is expanding. Um, so red is the hottest and then purple is sort of like code. And the other little arrows is what the fluid velocity is doing. Okay, so this is just an example of relativistic fluid simulation. And uh, most of these simulations are based on uh, formalism due to Israel and Stuart uh, going all the way back before I was born. And um, this has been improved and systematically studied over the years. The actual, the actual formulation that people use currently um, actually is due to uh, DNMR, these people here in 2012. And this really forms the basis for the state-of-the-art simulations. Uh, and if you have seen any heavy ion talk and people talk about hydrodynamics and flow coefficients like these things here, those are the observables, okay? So as the system expands, it produces a lot of particles. And one interesting thing is to see what type of particles, if it's you know, a proton, a pion, or a kaon, what type of particle goes where, with what angle, and with what energy? That's what these flow anisotropies are telling you. So there are several observables related um, to this flow uh, interpretation or this fluid interpretation of the quark one plasma. So if you have seen, uh, if you have ever seen any simulation or any uh, calculation compared to the data, it was based on those ideas. I can go back to that afterwards if you want to ask me. Um, there are several interesting things going on in these type of formulations, but this will not be my focus today. So one thing though that uh, has emerged, and it was quite a surprise, um, and I think Will and I are now old enough to see precisely that transition when people were um, sort you know, the, the whole paradigm shift going from um, what people thought because of asymptotic freedom, quarks and gluons, when they would be produced, they would be sort of like weakly interacting. And it turned out that's not the case. Um, so whatever happens there, uh, well, a very nice, uh, well understood quasi particle gases seems to not be really the case, at least when it comes to transport properties. And um, now we can boil down to the following plot, as you can see here. So here I'm plotting, uh, this is a, a figure from this paper. So this is just, this is the shear viscosity, the same shear viscosity we talked about last week that is basically uh, giving you an idea. Um, the relation between the force that uh, this fluid would feel here around, uh, uh, here on this plate as it moves in the y direction with a gradient in the x direction. So that's the shear viscosity. And this S here is the entropy density, okay? The standard entropy density you learn from thermodynamics. Once you divide these things, and remember, we are using natural units here. So in this case, this guy is dimensionless. Uh, we can compare this uh, quantity for different temperatures and different systems. You would see water, you would see helium. And it seems that the carbon plasma, as you try to extract this property by comparing data, to calculations using hydrodynamics seems to be a very small quantity. So small that is actually close to this uh, one of this famous one over four pi uh, uh, result from holography. Okay, so it's a very, very tiny uh, result. So this is basically the hallmark of what's called nearly perfect fluidity. Okay, and, it, and it's very important to stress that this is not an obvious thing. Uh, if you just look at the Lagrangian of QCD, you would not know 
that eight over s would be such a small quantity. So this is a new, it's a fundamental discovery that was made in the, high, the heavy ion program over decades. Now, okay, so for the purpose of this talk, um, so the idea here is to really think about what's going on. So let's think about this uh, hydrodynamic behavior a little bit more. Um, precisely for the case of heavy ion collisions, does this always apply? Or is it obvious that the QGP should behave like a fluid? Um, let's try to investigate this a little bit more. So going back a little bit over a decade, um, the idea was that yeah, no, yeah, fluid dynamics should work fine. Um, because you see, this is what in general, the field as a whole um, would think that that's what the QGP would look like. So look at this. This is the energy density as a function of the, uh, the, the transverse plane. So basically the particles collide. So there is an axis here, let's call it a Z. And then they collide like this, the nuclear. And then this plane is the X, Y plane. That's where we're concentrating on. Uh, that's where we see the dynamics, okay? So if the energy density or any other density um, was really smooth like this, you see it only varies over scales of the size of the radius of the nucleus. So here for a large nucleus of the order of five Fermi. So if we were to do our Knudsen number game or estimator for the, the applicability of hydrodynamics, we'd say that, okay, so the macroscopic scale will have to do with these gradients, which are of the order of one over L and L is basically this capital L here is basically the size of a large nucleus, like something like this size. And the microscopic scale will be associated with the temperature, uh, one over the temperature, okay? Which turns out for these collisions of the order of, of lambda QCD. So if then you can just uh, divide them, the little scale by the large scale, and then under these conditions, very smooth, very nice looking carbon plasma, and the Knudsen number, you know, is not very small, but it's also not very large. And it seems reasonable to think that fluid dynamics at scales of the size of a large nucleus may make sense. However, as always, reality is much more complicated and much more interesting. So it turns out that over the years, across many different discoveries in the field, it was understood that the initial state is really not that very smooth thing. So in fact, there are unavoidable quantum fluctuations in that initial state um, uh, for the, the incoming nuclei when they collide. And, and that's, in a sense, you should have expected, right? Because not only you talk about color fields that can fluctuate, but even at the level of hadronic physics of the scales of one Fermi or so, you still have you know, these, these little neutrons and protons that collide, they are not really uh, billiard balls, right? They are quantum mechanical objects. So there, are, there must be quantum fluctuations. And in fact, the system is such that there are very large gradients at early times. So the energy density doesn't look very smooth like before. It, rather, it looks more like these thing here with valleys and peaks and things like that. So if you're trying to estimate this Knudsen number, it turns out that it's large. It's basically something of order one, even for large systems, okay? So that's what this plot is showing. So this now gives us an opportunity to think about this a little bit deeper. Um, it's kind of like a paradox. This Knudsen number is never small, but somehow hydro still works. Um, and, and theoretically in the field, we are still trying to process this information. So this issue must be understood. And in fact, you know, theoreticians uh, like me, we spend a long time thinking about stuff like that, but experimentalists are much smarter. They just go and test things. And, uh, and this is something that happened, um, no, not really a decade ago, but maybe, maybe starting around 2014. So what they did is they found, okay, fine. So you think that this is interesting already for a large system. Imagine what I can do if I decrease the big system, which was the nucleus, now is a very tiny one. So for example, imagine that instead of having two big, uh, uh, very large uh, gold or lead nucleus colliding, forming a large system, imagine that I have a proton nucleus system or a deuteron or even a helium. And this is interesting in our field because the initial condition would have different shapes and different types of modes would be excited. And what people did, they said, okay, fine, let's try to do this and do this experimentally and see what it looks like. 
So it turns out, and that's really interesting, that uh, there were actually predictions for what the flow coefficients or for the distribution of particles uh, uh, that would come at different angles. And that's what this plot means here. So if you don't work in this field, just take from this plot that uh, the data seems to be well described by these calculations, at least to some degree. Uh, and these calculations come from relativistic uh, fluid calculations. Um, but now there is something interesting going on, right? Because um, we saw that even for a large system, the Knudsen number was not small. So that means that the big separation of scales that we wanted is not, doesn't seem to be necessarily there. But here's even worse because this, the, the big scale became smaller. So could you have hydrodynamics even without a large separation of scales? Is it possible to formulate something that is like far from equilibrium hydrodynamics? Those are fundamental questions that we've been investigating in this field. And there's a very large amount of activity going to these directions. Um, this is not the focus of the talk today, but this is something I wanted to keep, um, uh, that I want you to keep in mind because there are many new things going on and, and I can, I can um, answer some questions about that later. So all of these discoveries, the fact that things work, but we don't really truly understand why they work so well, uh, has been dubbed the surprising effectiveness of hydrodynamics and heavy ion collisions. So this is basically um, the idea. So just to summarize the type of fundamental questions that we see here, of course, the biggest, I would say, and this is really uh, fundamental, how does hydrodynamics emerge really from this very simple, not really, but simple looking uh, uh, small uh, um, scale interaction. So these are interactions between gluons and quarks and then gluons among themselves. So if you remember, the very first slide of this talk where we talked about why fluids so, are so ubiquitous in nature. This is uh, the embodiment of that phrase from Kadanoff and Goldenfeld uh, that you know, hydrodynamics can emerge out of very simple interactions. I mean, these are simple things, but as anybody that understood Q, has a study QCD, um, the fact that we have such interactions make things very complicated. And the other question is how does the underlying non abelian Right? The fact that we have gluons interact among themselves like this. This non-abelian quantum nature of QCD actually dictates the emergence of hydrodynamic behavior. What is new about the hydro, the fluid that comes out of heavy ion collisions precisely because of these non-abelian degrees of freedom? So there is a, this now I'm going to give is not a rigorous argument. It'll be very different than the rest of the talk that will show theorems and things like that. But this is something for you to think about. So imagine that you're talking about fluid dynamics for things of the size of a proton, okay? A proton is this cartoon <laughs> for us here. So this whole size here, this whole thing is of the order of a Fermi, 10 to the minus 15, okay? So for this to work as a standard fluid, one that you would learn in a course of fluid dynamics, you know, if you open Landau Lifshitz chapter one, Landau Lifshitz says very clearly, in order to have a fluid, what you do, you get this system and you break it into a bunch of little pieces, little subsystems. So basically little cells here that are much smaller than the size of the system, but they are still um, large in the sense that they still contain a lot of particles. There is still stuff around there such that you can still talk about the laws of thermodynamics for these subsystems. So let's be conservative and just divide this little guy into 10 pieces. So I have something of the order of Fermi, and let's say that I define my little cell by 0.1 Fermi. So I just break this guy into a bunch of little squares here. But look at this. Just by the certainty principle alone, if I just break this and put a little delta x of order 0.1 Fermi, um, just the uncertainty in momentum will be large of the order 2 GeV or more, which is larger than the average momentum that you find in these collisions, OK, involving all the particles. So what that means is that if you're trying to push a fluid dynamic interpretation here, for sure, quantum fluctuations should matter. And that's what this little cartoon is. This is a, actually not a something in finite temperature. It's just a simulation of the vacuum of QCD. But my point is to say that whatever is the physics, the fluid dynamics of the proton is not something standard. It should have more stuff going on. Basically, in, the, in technical language, you should not worry just about the one-point function 
of observables like the team you knew, the energy momentum tensor, things like that, you should consider high order point functions as well to see fluctuations at play. Okay, good. So um, this puts us in perspective. So if you think about the emergence of fluid dynamics uh, really far out, like sort of like a bird's eye view, um, this is a little cartoon where I'm plotting uh, quantumness. So how quantum the system is in the sense uh, how important H bar is for your physics. Okay, that goes in this axis. And on this axis here, we have the velocity involved, okay, very broadly defined. Um, so here, for example, it's relativistic. So this C, so C for us is one. So this guy would go from zero to one, okay? So here, is, it'll be very relativistic. So for example, we are here. For most of the things that we consider fluid dynamics in our um, you know, standard human experience, we are here at daily life, not very quantum, very far from that. And certainly the velocity is very small in comparison to the speed of light. If you go all the way up, keeping the system non-relativistic, you end up with things um, where coherence uh, between the atoms and the quantum mechanical system, uh, quantum mechanical properties are very important, end up with something like a Bose-Einstein condensate and other things here. On the other hand, if you go all the way up here, as you, as you start doing heavy ion collisions, you start from large systems where quantum fluctuations doesn't, don't seem to be so important in the description as you would hear for a uranium uranium and then gold gold. But as you keep going up, making the system smaller and smaller, quantum effects should be more relevant. You're still relativistic. And at some point you have to worry about other properties, for example, spin. Uh, what happens to the dynamics of spin uh, in your system? So this is more or less the landscape of the emergence of fluid dynamics. But this, I would say that was more or less the case up to maybe four to, no, maybe until before 2017. Then something happened. In 2017, so um, we measured for the first time uh, the, the result of the collisions between neutron stars. And that's where, of course, people have been thinking about this before, but this became extremely important and timely and hot in a physics sense uh, after the collisions of neutron stars and sort of created a new axis here that we now not only have to think about this, but also what happens to fluids at very strong, in the presence of very strong gravitational fields, okay? And this is where I'm going to focus at, uh, for the uh, remaining of the talk. This is now my other frontier, the frontier of the very large, you know, fluid dynamics and neutron stars and things like this. So, as I said, um, you know, 2017, gravitational waves were measured um, for neutron star from neutron star mergers, and now this gives us a tool to probe this ultra dense matter um, with gravitational waves. And also, it was very nice. There were also electromagnetic observations for that particular event. So this was really sort of like the most fantastic thing that could have happened exactly when you switch on, um, you know, the thing. So it's sort of amazing. So um, there are many angles that we can go uh, and explore here. But um, for me, I'm thinking about fluids and I'm um, thinking about thermodynamics. And of course, the very first thing that you should think about is what happens to the system in equilibrium. Do we even understand neutron star matter at all different scales within a neutron star in equilibrium? Um, well, no. <laughs> it turns out that the properties of matter at extreme baryon densities, what I'm saying extreme, so you know, the nucleus is something very, very, very dense. Okay. So the density of a nucleus um, is of the order of zero, like 16, 0 0.16 divided by Fermi cube. So this is a very, very, very large density. And in neutron stars, especially as you keep going towards the core of a neutron star, the density could be, a few could be a few times larger. So, but it turns out that we actually don't understand the, the equilibrium phase of matter under those conditions. So this remains unknown. In fact, this is, uh, you may have seen this many times, this is a, a cartoon of the phase diagram of QCD. So this is temperature. This is net baryon density. Or you can also think about it as chemical potential. Um, so we understand very well this part, the very large temperatures at very small densities, basically zero net baryon density. This part can be done uh, on the lattice. So they're very precise. Over decades, people have mastered 
um, uh, this type of calculation. Now we understand what happens here. So there is a crossover um, as you keep increasing the temperature at zero baron density. Of course, we, in the sense of things that have nuclei, you know, have nuclei, we are here. Okay, we will be like zero temperature and the density of a nucleus. Um, and now one of the things that are interesting in heavy ion collisions is that uh, while the LHC focused on this part, as you keep decreasing the collision energy between the nuclei, we expect to start probing a larger density of, of, of the net baryons. So that you start probing something that is still hot, but not as hot, but a little bit denser. And there are several structures that we expect. So you would go from a hadronic phase to our quark one plasma phase, but actually there are arguments based on symmetries and some model calculations that would predict that it should be some first order phase transition here, which means that since here it's a crossover and here's a first order, this must end at a second order phase transition where there will be a critical point. So this is, if you have heard about this, this will be the famous QCD critical point. Um, and as you go to very, very large densities and smaller and smaller temperatures, there are other phases could emerge. Uh, basically, quarks uh, can start pairing and produce something very similar to a superconductor. It's called a color superconductor, which would be indeed the ground state of QCD at very, very, very large densities. So the important part to take from here is that there is a lot of structure and there is a lot of interest. These are, you know, these questions are worth billions of dollars. And let me now show you what we understand and what we know it's true at least, is this. <laughs> um, this part that is covered, we really don't know, okay? And there is a fundamental issue for that, is that even in equilibrium, remember every point in phase space is an equilibrium state. Even in equilibrium, we don't actually know what's going on here. There are fundamental issues um, that appear at the technical level. When you try to compute the partition function of QCD, with temperature and density, okay, and finite chemical potential. Um, this is called the sign problem. This is some, some fundamental problem that appears not only in QCD, it appears in condensed matter and some other systems um, that actually prevents us from understanding precisely what's going on here. So there's a lot of opportunity for research just in equilibrium. Okay, but equilibrium is not really my focus, okay? I wanna go even beyond. So I wanna ask a very simple question, okay? So now I have this neutron star, the density is very large, it's a lump of very rich barium, uh, very barium rich matter. I wanna understand how this behaves under these very strong gravitational fields. So for example, when you have your neutron star, right? So you have the collision of neutron stars, they start, they are uh, in, uh, rotating around each other like this. This is the in spiral phase, right? At some point, so these things are emitting gravitational waves, not a lot, so it takes a long time for these things to start to inspire and get closer and closer to the They merge, that's what this thing is, is showing here. Um, so you start, this is actually close to the merger. They merge, uh, so you see there's still some angular momentum here. And um, you know gravitational waves are produced from this system. So this is a figure from this research group. So my question is more like, besides the equation of state, the properties in equilibrium, what else can we learn? Are there signatures of deconfinement or some phase transition, some new type of phase transition that we didn't even think about? Um, and especially, are there viscous effects, some non-ideal things that produce entropy that could be relevant to the dynamics of neutron star mergers? People have been thinking about this for many years, and, and this is just an example here. Uh, one of the ideas is to think about bulk viscosity. So, um, and how bulk viscosity could make a uh, difference in mergers. And the idea is basically the following. So remember bulk viscosity, as we discussed in the last uh, talk, bulk viscosity has to do with the following question. Uh, how do you produce entropy if your volume is changing, okay? In a particular way. So for example, here you see some radial expansion, okay? So the system goes from here to here. That's what this expansion rate is telling you. Bulk viscosity measures. Uh, that the amount of entropy that's produced in this process. And now think about what's going on in a neutron star, right? So a neutron star is here, so you have the merger, and just consider some little fluid cell. Um, of course, a little fluid cell in a neutron star still has a lot of particles, a lot of things going on. But this little fluid cell, just like it happened uh, when we talked about fluid cells in the other talk, you know, it's squished, and, you know, it's, it's pressed, 
uh, and it can oscillate in size, right? So there could be radial, for example, radial oscillations that affect these little uh, fluid elements. And this is just from a simulation that these people here use in their paper, just to see how much the temperature varies for a given fluid cell. As a function of time, you see there are several uh, oscillations and variations in temperature, which leads to variations in the density. Okay, and this is very important. Now it's uh, it's really cool because before when I was talking about heavy ions, the focus was really the strong interactions. But here, what drives the viscosity, if it's if it's relevant, would be really the weak interactions because as you vary the density, the concentration of neutrons and protons change because of uh, basically beta processes. So you could have orca processes here from the weak interactions, a neutron going to a proton, electron, and antineutrino. And you could also have something else called modified orca processes when you have a neutron getting some other, yes, sorry? It's that... Oh, okay. So um, when you have a neutron getting some other uh, uh, hadron there and then producing a proton and, and, and an electron and a, and a neutrino. So this is something that is, people have been studying and there are several papers that investigate this. These are just a few of them. So this is a possibility. Maybe something like that is happening in a neutron star. It could be relevant. So um, we have investigated this using um, uh, state-of-the-art simulations, but those simulations are ideal hydro simulations in the sense that there was no real viscosity being solved. So people are solving Einstein's equations coupled to a perfect fluid. Um, so there's no viscosity there, okay? And the goal here is just to estimate how large the viscous corrections would be if they were included, okay? So that's the level that we are at. Um, and this, uh, this is a complicated plot. Basically, you have curves with different densities. But this is basically what it's saying is that what would be the magnitude of viscous effects? In this case, uh, in this case, uh, bulk viscous effect. And maybe this is more relevant for you. Um, we have an estimate of the bulk effects in heavy ion collisions compared to what one would expect from neutron stars. It is a small value, okay? But um, maybe it's relevant. Uh, certainly not now because uh, neutron star mergers, uh, we actually don't even see the merger phase. Uh, so the, the, the current detectors can only measure the in spiral phase. But maybe in the future, for the next generation of, of gravitational wave detectors, we'll be actually sensitive to see the merger properties. And maybe some of these dynamics could be relevant there. So um, as I said, what we could have done is to do some estimate for bulk viscous effects. And one of the main issues that appear here is that in order to do these calculations, we need a formulation of viscous relativistic fluid dynamics that actually works. And it makes sense to be solved with Einstein's equations. Okay, so now. In a sense, you shouldn't have any approximation. You get Einstein's equations, the fluid equation, and solve them together. Can this make sense? Okay. So the question is, how does one consistently formulate viscous fluids in relativity? So in order to talk about viscous fluids, let me just introduce to you relativistic ideal fluids, things that don't uh, really generate entropy, okay, where the entropy is conserved. So differently than our, our other talk, where the main degrees of freedom uh, involved like uh, um, uh, non-relativistic things, like a three-dimensional velocity and things like that, now we go to relativity and the observables change a little bit. So the main observable here for us, for example, will, will be those two: the energy momentum tensor. Okay, so this uh, technically this is just this is an expectation value of some quantum operator. That's what this means here. And this T mu is a matrix, a four by four matrix that describes basically what's going on with the energy momentum in your system, okay? So you have some components of the energy density, momentum density, energy flux, and the whole shear stress that you can have pressure and some off diagonal uh, terms. So all of it, all of that information is encoded here in uh, the energy momentum tensor. And there is a conservation law. So because E is, equal to mc squared, we cannot really distinguish anymore like we did before, conservation of mass and conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. It's the whole thing together under a um, bigger and more important thing called conservation of energy momentum. And that's what this means. This, uh, this tensor should be divergent to us. And, uh, but you still, you can have matter. In this case, for the neutron star is very relevant. You have some net 
baryon density going somewhere, some amount of baryons going somewhere. And that's what this current measures. This is a four current um, and this expectation value of this operator. And again, because the baryon current, at least for the, the, you know, the physics that we're considering here in the standard model uh, is conserved. So um, that's what the statement here, okay? D mu J mu equals zero. And we, at the end of the last uh, uh, seminar, we actually went and described that physics in this language. So you should be familiar with that for those that don't work in this field. So, but now we have to think about it, you know, a little bit from a more practical perspective. Um, I have five equations of motion. Here there are five equations because nu can go from zero, one, two, three. And here's just one equation. This is a Lorentz scalar. But I have in principle 10 in the T mu nu and four in the J variables. So as it stands, I don't know what's going to do. <laughs> um, so we do the crudest approximation, which is ideal fluid dynamics, in the case, which is the case of zero entropy production. In this case, things work out perfectly. You define equilibrium just like we did before with a temperature, a chemical potential mu, and a velocity. Okay, so this velocity looks like it's four variables. Indeed, it is, is a four, indeed it is, is a four vector, but there is a constraint. Okay, the constraint is that this vector has to be a normalized time like future pointing uh, um, uh, a four vector. Okay, so in the end, we actually only have five variables because this guy is constrained. And um, in this case, we can actually very nicely decompose the energy momentum tensor and the current into this structure. So the energy momentum tensor becomes the energy density and the flow plus the pressure and some little operator here. So this guy, oh, I didn't write. Oh, but I wrote in the last lecture, uh, uh, in, in the last uh, seminar. But this delta mu nu is just some operator that tells you that you're in the space orthogonal to the flow, okay? So, but the point is, uh, and the current goes in the direction of the flow and there is some density. Uh, and these quantities, these are thermodynamic quantities, epsilon, P and N, and they are related to each other via the equation of state of the matter, okay? That's where the microphysics comes in. And now it's okay, because we had we have five uh, nonlinear PDEs for these variables, and we have five variables. So in principle, we should try and see if we can solve it. And people have studied this for many uh, years, and there are several interesting results that appear. Um, the first first is that this dynamics, this is compatible with relativity. So this is causal. When the speed of sound, the speed of sound of your system, which is computed this way, is not larger than the speed of light. Okay. So it should be also a known negative quantity, as you can see here is C S squared. Uh, but N1 is the speed of light. So if this behaves like you would expect, uh, the system will have several properties. Basically, the very first property is that given some initial temperature chemical potential and flow velocity that you set up in your initial conditions, one can prove that the subsequent evolution of the system forms a, a locally well-posed or has a locally well-posed initial value problem. What I mean is the following. If you start with um, sufficiently uh, smooth or well-defined uh, initial conditions for these variables, the subsequent evolution is unique, which is very important, right? We want to solve equations that have unique solutions. And um, the, the solution exists, okay? So you also want to solve equations that can have solutions. Remember, this is not a trivial thing. The equations are highly nonlinear and they're all coupled, okay? So it's not trivial to establish this property of locally well-posed initial value problem. The other thing that is important, and this comes out here, is that you want the equations to be such that if you change a little bit the initial state, the solution changes continuously, okay? So this is also a property that is nice to have established. And causality, I mean here, is precisely what you see in this plot. So if you have some point here that will be in the future of this uh, Cauchy surface here, the physics of this point is fully determined by some region, some domain, some... Uh, finite domain in the past. That's what this means here, okay? So information can go here. So uh, if, you are, if you are at this point, you're only influenced by stuff that was in here, not here or some other crazy point. Okay, so there's a finite domain of influence. And it's, that's the standard thing that you think about the light cone and things like that. Um, that's, that's the idea. So you can actually rigorously prove these things. 
And another property that is important is that it's well tested in numerical algorithms. So people know how to solve this numerically, including even Einstein's equations, okay, to solve for the, the metric and the fluid, uh, fluid combined and, and interacting. Great. Now let's go to a better approximation uh, for the things that we're interested in, the case of viscous fluids where entropy is produced. So now what you do, um, you still have T mu nu and you still have J, of course, T mu nu and the current exists, no matter if you're in equilibrium or not. But how do you describe, how do you break this down into fluid dynamic variables? Well, the first thing that you should realize is that if, if you wanna produce entropy, just like before uh, in, in, the, in the previous talk, uh, that we had to include more terms, the same thing happens. Not only you have the original terms that appeared uh, in equilibrium, but also there could be corrections. For example, this is a correction to the, the energy density. This is a correction to the equilibrium equation of state. This is a shear stress tensor, okay? And this is called the energy diffusion. It's a correction uh, coming from the diffusion of energy. This is a correction to the current, to the number density. And this is the diffusion current, okay? And this, the, the fact that we could break this team into several pieces like that has been appreciated for many, many years since Israel and Stewart. And the point that you should take from this slide is that dissipation implies that you have many more terms that you have to somehow specify. But how does one fix such terms? Of course, further assumptions are needed, right? So the standard approach that goes back to what I said on, on, on Friday, last Friday, is that you consider the system near equilibrium. If the system is near equilibrium, these things here have to be such, these new fields that appear, they have to be such that it should go to zero in equilibrium. And then out of equilibrium, they can have some value, right? Uh, you should also impose that the system should be compatible with the second law of thermodynamics. And at least in the non-relativistic limit, when the velocities involved are very, very tiny in comparison to the speed of light, and the gradients and the derivatives are small, you should go back to the standard Navier-Stokes equations that you had, uh, that you saw last Friday. Okay, so um, let's think about the, the, one of the ways to construct such theories, and that's the focus here, is the near equilibrium expansion. So what is the, the, the main assumption behind this derivative expansion? Um, just like last Friday, so you assume that in order to describe a viscous system that is sufficiently close to equilibrium, you can describe it using the same variables that appeared before. The same in the sense that I'm still talking about temperature, chemical potential, and flow velocity. And I still impose locality in the sense that corrections from viscosity or from entropy production appear in terms of derivatives. In the sense that, just, just think about this, in the, imagine the global equilibrium state where the temperature is constant and uniform. If you wanna get out of equilibrium, that it has to be because this temperature varies in space and time. So that's why we normally associate dissipative quantities with derivatives of these high dynamic variables. And being able to specify that goes back to the constitutive relations. This is how you specify those different fields, the dissipative fields in terms of derivatives of these quantities. And then the, the idea is really nice because in principle now, so you see, um, we are building our effective theory. We're talking about the degrees of freedom. We're talking about the symmetries and how you systematically construct your uh, effective theory. In fact, you start from ideal hydrodynamics. This is the place. And what is the small parameter? The small parameter is precise that Knudsen number that ratio between the micro and the large scale, when that thing is very, very small, remember, that's what we think the fluid dynamic regime appears, and we can do it here. To zeroth order in Knudsen number, we have ideal fluid physics, no entropy being produced. And then to first order, we have to include these fields and write this in a systematic way. That's the idea. And it has been, in fact, this idea for many, many years. Uh, and when I say many, many years, I really mean it. I mean, this goes back to 1940. Uh, uh, when Eckert and then afterwards Landon and Lifshitz wrote down the very first uh, attempts to describe relativistic uh, viscous fluids. And um, they made a very interesting, so this is, you know, of course, the, sort of the foundations of the field. And there are several interesting uh, assumptions. The ones that I'm going to highlight here is precisely this one. So basically, the point is the following based on their intuition of what temperature, uh, chemical potential, flow velocity should be in the ideal case, they said, oh, okay. Um, I'm just going to do this thing in such a way that I define 
that those new variables, for example, the correction to the energy, the correction to the number density, and in this case, I'm talking about Eckert. Okay, so Eckert assumed this, that the correction to uh, coming from particle diffusion is zero. Then this is what I have. I have my ideal current. So the baryon current is just like ideal current. And, but the team in you has more structures. It has a bulk, it has a shear, and it has this uh, uh, energy diffusion that here really measures the heat flux. And here, we do just like before in the normal relativistic case, we just write down the general structures. So for the scalar, we have a bulk viscous scalar here. That's the pi. Here is where the bulk viscosity enters. And here, now I have d mu u mu. This is the expansion uh, rate. Um, the shear stress, you have, to, you have to work a little bit harder for this. The shear stress has several properties. It has to be a symmetric tensor. It has to be orthogonal to the flow. And it has to be traceless. Once we impose these uh, conditions, this is the expression that you can write. This is the shear viscosity. And this thing here is the shear tensor. It basically tells you what happens with the system when, when, when it's distorted like that. And Q is the heat flux, okay? So just like before, that you have something that is hotter and something that is colder, there is some little current going through. That's what it means here. Um, you see here, you would recognize the derivative of the temperature that we saw before, but there is some something cool that actually Eckert was, I think, the first one to realize that in relativity, you could have some component of acceleration coming in. So then you have, you know, the three standard uh, physics effects. Expansion, uh, uh, bulk, shear, and thermal connectivity. However, and this is a problem that we alluded to in the beginning of the talk, there are many issues that appear in these theories. And these issues go back to uh, Pichon, I think was the first one to show that these equations are acausal, uh, in actually in the nonlinear regime. And uh, his Kaplan-Bloom, this is the paper that we all know in our field, they show that the theory not only is acausal, but it's actually unstable. Is unstable in the following sense. So first, causality is out, which is a bad thing if you want to have an initial valid problem in a relativistic context. But also, it, it's a very strange type of fluid. And that's what the, the little joke that I made here is that what it actually predicts is that global equilibrium itself, which we all think should be stable, right? If the system is in global equilibrium, we give a little kick and then it goes back to equilibrium. Boom. That's not what this thing tells you. It actually makes the ridiculous prediction that uh, um, these equations would predict modes that only go faster than the speed of light, but actually render the, the idea of equilibrium actually unstable, which is bad. And this is something that, you know, as, as you see, is an old problem, but there is a lot of activity trying to understand this. And one of the things that have been understood, I would say um, quite fully now, uh, very recently, is that causality is needed um, to describe the stability or the equilibrium of a, uh, uh, the stability of an equilibrium state in a relativistic system. So basically the point is that dissipation is only a Lorentz invariant concept in causal theories. And, and that's what this sort of diagram tells you. So this is, um, so I did a lot of work on this, but I think the paper that explained this in a way that I couldn't, <laughs> that I thought it was amazing was this paper by Gavacino here. And then I really recommend you to see um, also. So basically the point is the following. Imagine that you have some event that happens here, okay? And uh, you see the influence of this event is larger. So imagine that I'm an observer and that's what I see. So here, this the influence is larger and then uh, it gets uh, uh, less and less important as it propagates in time. But imagine that the theory is a causal. So if the theory is a causal, so this will be the light cone and this will be what we're we calling here the a causal cone. Imagine that, you know, the things can propagate at speed of twice the speed of light. That's basically what you can draw here. However, while this could look fine for you, imagine that there is another observer. Remember, the theory is still largest covariant. Imagine there is another observer B that is connected to this, to, to you, by a Lorentz transformation, okay? So imagine that you start here. That's the first initial state. So it sees, look at that. Um, it actually sees something going on here, very, very small disturbance. But then, what actually sees instead of what you saw is that the disturbance that happens goes back to equilibrium. So you see something stable, but there will always be another observer connected to you such that as time goes by for this observer, this observer will see the disturbance getting larger and larger and larger as a function of time. This is, of course, the hallmark of an instability, okay? Um, and there are several other arguments, but you can see the understanding now is that you really need causal theories to describe Lawrence, uh, uh, dissipation of Lorentz invariant uh, manner. 
So um, let me talk about the solution. So Will, uh, I'm assuming that I have a little bit more time, but let me know. So that's why I sort of prepared it longer than normal. Yeah, please keep going. This keep is going. Awesome. Keep going. Keep okay, going. okay. So let me now tell you about the solution, um, at least for um, this case of theories constructing in the derivative expansion. So, and this is this uh, new first order formulation. Um, this was worked out by uh, myself and my collaborators here. And uh, there was also a lot of uh, work by uh, Pavel Kovtun uh, afterwards. So uh, the, idea, the idea is the following, okay? Um, it's, it's somehow very subtle, but it's, uh, it's a very conservative solution to something that has been going on for many years. The idea is the following. So, you know, imagine that you're in equilibrium, okay? In equilibrium, of course, you always have your T mu nu and your J mu. Those are just expectation values of quantum operators. In principle, they have nothing to do with hydrodynamics per se. And in equilibrium, you can unambiguously define your temperature, your uh, chemical potential, and your flow velocity. And that's what I did here. And you know, this is a nice uh, um, way to show what equilibrium should be. Is a nice cup of coffee that you can all have. And I'm gonna have one soon here. <laughs> Um, but you know, if you're ever in doubt how to explain what T mu nu is, this is a little joke for the experts. Uh, that's what T mu <laughs> that's what T mu nu is. Okay, so you have your T mu nu, your J mu, and they have a well-defined mapping between these variables and these variables in equilibrium. However, imagine that now you are out of equilibrium. Of course, T mu nu and J mu are still well-defined, right? The you know physics doesn't care how you name things. The amount, the important thing is that there's some amount of energy momentum going somewhere and amount, some amount of bearing on stuff going somewhere. So this is always well defined. However, if you are out of equilibrium, like you know what happened to the disaster here with the coffee, um, one thing that has been understood but it was never truly appreciated is that of course how you break these guys down into the actual dynamical variables that you're solving, the things that you solve for your differential equations, temperature, chemical potential, flow velocity, they are not, they are not uniquely defined. In fact, Eckert has its definition, had its definition, Linda Lifted had its definition, actually Israel had another definition of paper in 1971. And it was understood that, you know, in principle, you had the freedom to check these things. But it was truly never appreciated is that, yes? No, no, somebody outside, go ahead. Okay, uh, but what's truly never appreciated is that um, once you, of course, have this freedom, you need to study it systematically. And that basically, that basically what we did. So I think that the problem that happened before is that now, right, in 2023, um, we as theoreticians, we see physics a little bit different in the sense that we see everything as an effective theory, and we try to construct it systematically, think about symmetries and things like that. And back in the past, these ideas, I don't think were so well understood um, like they are, uh, they are now. So what do we do? What we do is the following. We go back and just thinking about effective theory, we write down the most general thing that you can possibly have, okay? Sorry for the notation, this little curly epsilon here, um, would have the energy density in equilibrium plus some correction. This curly pressure would have the pressure in equilibrium plus some correction, just like before. The same thing for these, and this guy here would have the energy density in equilibrium plus some correction. So what we do, we just write down the most general structure that you can have, and we still use the same idea, right? So it's a very conservative thing. Uh, we still use the same idea that we do a systematic expansion in derivatives or in powers of the Knudsen number. The same idea at zeroth order Knudsen number, this is, uh, is ideal physics. And then the first order, and then in principle, you can go to second order and third order. But what is the difference? The difference is that um, because an effective theory, you really have to write down the most general terms that you can possibly have. They are consistent with the power count, in this case, derivatives, and compatible with the symmetries, okay? And if it turns out that, uh, and it turns out that when you do this, you actually see that there are many, many, many more terms that people missed, you know, over decades. So basically, the energy density, the part, uh, so this would be the co-moving energy density, the energy density of, uh, um, measured by an observer that moves together with the fluid. This, in principle, this uh, uh, observer would see not only the equilibrium energy density, but it could also see 
other corrections. And you see, and this is a very important point. These corrections, they involve, again, the hydrodynamic variables, temperature, flow, and chemical potential. But there is an important point here. These corrections are such that each one of them separately are zero in equilibrium. Okay, so you can show that the conditions for equilibrium are such that this particular co-moving derivative of the temperature has to be zero, theta, the expansion scale has to be zero, and this derivative of the chemical potential have to be zero. So what you do, you add every single possible term that you can possibly write, that all could be zero, they would be zero in equilibrium separately, right? So that's why you have many, many more terms. And of course, if the system is out of equilibrium, these things switch on. But you see, instead of assuming that every one of these things were zero, like it was done before, we say, no, we don't know if they're zero. This is an effective theory. You put the most general thing, and then we try to compute them from some microscopic physics. And this type of theory, as you see, has, in principle, many more coefficients. The, it does have, of course, the usual transport coefficients, shear viscosity, bulk viscosity, and thermal connectivity. But it has more. And then you could ask, OK, but what are these other things? Well, these other parameters, these ones that you don't recognize, epsilons and, and pi's, threes, and new threes, these new coefficients, they basically are there to truly parameterize this freedom, this inherent freedom that you always had when choosing the variables in your approach, okay? This in the field is called hydrodynamic frame. And this frame has nothing to do really with a Lorentz frame or something like this. This is just a definition of the hydrodynamic variables, okay? So the point here is to say that every time you decompose T mu nu and J mu into some other variables, you're choosing a definition of those hydrodynamic variables. And, and that's the important part, not all definitions are good. The ones done by Landau and Eckert clearly are not. They lead to a causal theories and also uh, unstable theories. And then the question is, um, fine, you have these most general terms, but what choices are physical? And actually, let's think about here. I mean, this is something that may not have been appreciated at the time, but it is very, of course, it has worked, okay? So everything will work out as you see. But if it didn't, <clears throat> if the thing that I'm going to tell, if this had not solved the problem, it would be in trouble for the following reason, right? So let's think again about effective field theories. We have very clear guidelines. We define the degrees of freedom. We define the expansion parameter. We uh, make sure to include every single possible term consistent with the symmetries, right? Of course, these things can get renormalized, just like happened in QFT, but you have to include all these possible terms. If for some reason, by putting all the possible terms that people have missed, this had not worked, it would be bad, okay? So I can tell you that this was the whole motivation why I started this, because I was thinking about this very deeply and I was like, I do not understand for the life of me what is not working before, okay? When I was doing, you know, think about Lando and Eckert and this approach, because it looked correct, but it was not truly because they actually missed this idea that you have to put all the possible terms. So what choices are physical? Well, in the regime of validity of the theory, so you construct the effective theory, this is valid for first order theories. Uh, you can show that any choice of variable satisfies the second law of thermodynamics uh, if the standard constraints are there for these transport coefficients. But um, there is something very interesting, and that's the point, that once you have all these coefficients, now we can look and see what happens to the evolution, the time evolution of this theory. Uh, will uh, the evolution be causal? Is the initial value problem well posed? Can you actually couple these equations to ice equations for a given choice of these coefficients? And it turns out that you can, okay? And this comes out into uh, several papers, but this is sort of summarized now in this paper in 2022, where we actually prove, uh, and this is you know, really rigorously proven, uh, two of my collaborators are actually mathematicians. Um, and that's what this theorem one is saying here, is basically telling you that it is indeed possible to prove that the whole system, uh, not including just the fluid, fluid plus Einstein's equations, um, is actually well-defined. There is a local, uh, locally well-posed initial value problem. If those new parameters, those epsilons and things like that, obey certain conditions, okay? So it's pretty interesting because it turns out that we still have an infinite freedom regarding how you define temperature, chemical potential, 
and flow velocity out of equilibrium. But this infinite, it's a little bit smaller than the other infinite that you had before. So among all the possible choices, there is a large uncountable set of, of, of definitions that actually lead to well-defined theories. So basically what one can do is to restrict uh, your case to study just those, the, the good ones. You can choose the good set, but you still have a lot of freedom. And this is very precisely given as conditions that one can just use and um, compute, you know, do calculations with. So in fact, this, this was a significant process. It, it actually, a uh, progress, it gave uh, the very first proof of causality stability in the sense of uh, near equilibrium physics, and actually strong hyperbolicity in local well poisons for viscous fluids plus ices equations. So this, precisely this last statement, so strong hyperbolicity, uh, or just hyperbolicity in general is a mathematical term, but it's basically saying, that um, um, it, it's basically a way for us to tell that the equations behave um, like a wave, okay? But not just like a linear wave, but uh, it'll be like a nonlinear wave evolving. And actually these statements are fully nonlinear, okay? So there are no assumptions um, that come here. So this is valid for full general relativity. You can use this close to a black hole. Of course, black holes are weird, but you know, for a neutral star, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, and the, the proof is very, very general. And, and if you are interested in that kind of stuff, please take a look at that. Um, this gives a consistent generalization of what the never Soaks equation should be in general relativity. And it actually came out as a very nice synergy between physicists and mathematicians. So it's very good um, if you have the opportunity to talk to people and reach across the aisle for, or across another department, talk to them. Um, uh, there could be some cool things that come up. So, yes. Could you just go back? Uh, the previous slide, please. So you earlier were making the case that causality and stability are deeply related. So yes. it's this statement that you have that it's the first proof of causality, stability, strong hyperbolicity, and uh, local well posedness. Um, not, and I, I'm not trying to minimize. I'm really curious to probe what is the difference between those various statements. When are they yes. equivalent and when are they different? Yeah. Yes, yes. So um, so the first thing, so it's basically there are different things that you're checking. So for causality, what you do, you look at your nonlinear set of differential equations and you actually look at the characteristic velocities. Okay, so those will give you the maximum propagation of anything that is propagating your system. And when you say causality, we mean uh, that we can compute these things, which in general are very hard to compute for complicated nonlinear equations. And that's where, in fact, those constraints, those inequalities are coming from for the parameters. Uh, when we impose that those velocities cannot be larger than the speed of light, uh, that gives you a constraint for the parameters. So that is the first calculation. If stability is different, okay? So when I talk about causality, I'm not assuming equilibrium or anything. I just, you know, imagine that you put your mathematician hat and you look at the equations and you say, compute this, <laughs> impose that it's smaller than one, boom, then you get the conditions. Stability is a little bit different. Stability is a stability around equilibrium, okay? Uh, it's basically saying now consider a linearization of the theory around equilibrium and look at Fourier modes, just like we did last Friday and see what those omega as a function of K are, okay? So this is a different type of calculation. And when we say causality and stability, it's actually pretty interesting. Causality is a necessary condition for stability, but it's not sufficient, okay? So you can write down uh, very simple examples of causal theories that would not be thermodynamically stable, okay. okay? That's the point. And strong hyperbolicity is like, if you put a mathematician handy, now you put three more. <laughs> it's basically not only the, the equations in the full nonlinear regime coupled to Einstein, they have this property of causality, but actually you want to prove more. You want to prove that the equation, they have particular aspect, the particular form, such that you can actually prove local opposeness, which is that the, the solutions exist, they are unique and things like that. So strong hyperbolicity, basically, uh, you look at the equations, there is a, I have a slide about that afterwards, if you want to see, but it's, it's really cool. So basically look at the system of PDEs, so these nonlinear PDEs, and you can actually state some properties about the, the particular matrices that appear. Um, it's basically a statement saying, yes, you can solve it. So for example, Einstein's equations are strongly hyperbolic. Okay. Um, so that's, that's basically the idea. Does it make sense? Yes, yeah, so I think you really clearly point out the difference between causality and stability. 
And then I just want to understand, so strong hyperbolicity and local well posedness, those are equivalent statements or those are, again, different statements? Well, yeah, strong hyperbolicity is a statement about the differential equations. That's the, some properties of differential equations. Then you can use strong hyperbolicity to prove local well posedness. That's the point. So, okay, causality does not imply stability. Stability does not imply strong hyperbolicity. And strong hyperbolicity, if you work for it, will imply local well posedness. That's the point. And then, but then local well posedness does not necessarily imply strong hyperbolicity. No, not necessarily. Okay, super. Yeah. Okay. Good. So there have been many uh, results or many people studying this theory in different fields. So for example, mathematicians are studying this thing. This, uh, this guy is a mathematician uh, to study what happens to shock waves uh, in this theory. There have been actually simulations. So get these equations tried to solve. So Franz Pretorius in Princeton, who you know, has worked a lot on black hole physics and black hole mergers, uh, working with Pandya, Alex Pandya, who was a student there, and uh, Leas Mills, who was a postdoc and now is going to be faculty at Caltech. They solved this theory under very different conditions. For example, this is a simulation. It's a really cool simulation. You can see here the emergence of some instability. Um, it's a standard hydrodynamic instability that appears. And also there are other people thinking about it. Um, for example, I did some work related to kinetic theory and how to derive this theory from, how to derive these equations from kinetic theory. Other people looked at MHD, magnetohydrodynamics. And this is a paper that if it's correct, is really interesting. Um, I cannot judge if it's correct. This is really a mathematician's paper. Uh, but basically what this person claims is that for several, if you make a lot of assumptions to simplify, like the equation of state is simple, a bunch of coefficients to throw to zero and things like that. So this person has claimed that they can actually prove that there are, uh, the equilibrium, the stability thing that I talked about before, which was in the linear regime, that's the only thing we did, they claim that they can do this in non, the nonlinear regime, in the sense that the equilibrium state is actually nonlinearly stable. Um, this is a very hard thing to do, but I guess um, he seems to have done it. So there are many opportunities here. I would like to highlight that in case uh, people uh, got interested in this. So. Of course, it'll be very interesting to actually see realistic solutions, uh, not only heavy ion collisions, these are things that we are sort of pursuing here, but also in general relativity. Um, it'll be interesting to see, for example, what happens um, for gravitational collapse. I know there are people working on this already, trying to see what happens to the viscous fluid in gravitational collapse. There are, uh, of course, some phenomenological applications in nuclear and astrophysics. And it'll be very interesting to investigate the behavior of the solutions near black holes. Right, because now in principle you can solve these things uh, in the presence of strong gravity. So maybe there will be some cool thing coming up. Um, it'll be interesting to investigate uh, what happens to the equilibrium state if it's really globally stable as you would expect under nonlinear uh, perturbations, and extend this to GR. I mean, this will be a fantastic achievement. I think we're very far from actually doing this. And another thing that is pretty cool is to include stochastic fluctuations. So, you know, putting a stochastic source is something that's very interesting uh, that happens in heavy ion collisions. And a lot of people have discussed this. And um, it's also interesting because it's sort of like the path towards turbulence. And I think there's a lot of stuff that is interesting in relativistic turbulence for us to think about. And turbulence appears in neutron stars, uh, neutron star mergers because of very strong magnetic fields. So I think there's a lot of uh, very deep physics to be probed there. So in the conclusions, um, <laughs> I think uh, heavy ion collisions that are shown here provide a way to probe this QCD fluid at first in a really far from equilibrium regime. And we are trying to understand why hydrodynamics works there. So um, explaining why that works, why hydrodynamic can work even if you're very far from equilibrium is a, is a big challenge. There's a lot of people in the field thinking about it. Uh, neutron star mergers uh, may be crucial to unravel this novel fluid phenomena related to viscosity maybe that emerge in ultra dense QCD matter, right? Things that are much larger than standard nuclear saturation density. Um, I believe this new theory of viscous fluids that I showed here uh, could be useful to describe viscous effects, uh, not only have yankulis, but also in, in really dynamical situations. Yeah. Generally. At least it is by far the theory that has all the properties that you want. And it's the most general thing that you can do in one framework. So maybe it has some resemblance to the truth. And, and, and finally, I believe this, this synergy 
between heavy ion collisions and neutron stars and neutron star mergers, I think it's it's really a, a good thing. It's a big thing, and it will be even bigger in the future. And I, and I, I truly believe that it's bound to lead to new fundamental questions about nature, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Super, that was that was awesome. Thank you very much. Um, can we have questions from the audience? So, you say anything about second order? Yes. Oh, okay. So, so, okay. Then I was curious, like, uh, you, you showed that Israel is over there, and, and, I, and I was wondering if uh, the satisfies whatever conditions you, you, you uh, you had like in this first order. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Thank you for bringing this up. Um, I think <laughs> I have some, I think I have some slides that I can show about this. Let me see how, oh, actually it's right here. Look at that. So yeah, second order theories, the so-called second order theories. Um, what, and you know, this is uh, widely used in our field and, and this is something that I use as well. I like those theories a lot. Um, but the, here the philosophy is different, okay? The philosophy is different in the sense that we do have, of course, these out of equilibrium things like the pi, for example. Here, this is the simplest theory that it can possibly write. Um, so this is just bulk viscosity. So ideal fluids with a bulk viscosity, okay? Um, the, the idea is different because you see before, I was considering sort of like an effective theory. I had my degrees of freedom and I'm doing some systematic expansion around it. Here, um, and, and in fact, what that led to, it led to writing pi in terms of derivatives of, for example, epsilon or u and things like this, right? That's not the point in Israel Stewart. In Israel Stewart, um, from the very, uh, if you think about it in the phenomenological sense, uh, starting from the entropy current, what you say, of course, is that, oh, I have my entropy in equilibrium and then I have disturbances with respect to equilibrium. And the disturbance with respect to equilibrium because equilibrium has to be a maximum of the entropy, they come quadratically in the fields. But it turns out, and, and in fact, in the field, uh, people mostly call this Israel Stewart like theories. So it's basically the idea that instead of writing pi as a constitutive relation, we actually write down a differential equation for pi. So pi is like a new variable. And in this particular very simple case is that the one that I'm writing here. Okay, so now pi obeys some uh, uh, relaxation equation. Um, it has some neutral transfer coefficient. So here the difference is that instead of pi being zeta times the expansion rate, pi relaxes towards that within a time scale, which is the second order uh, coefficient called the relaxation time. Cool, so, but then, um, you know, people can try to look at this, and we actually have done this uh, in 2019. We looked at the simplest theory and see if we can actually um, uh, establish some properties. So one thing that is actually funny is that uh, it is true that these theories, uh, going back to work by Hiscock, Lindblom, and others, they actually established that these theories can be, if you choose the coefficients right, as you would expect, they can be causal and stable in the linear regime. And that's a, somehow there's a misconception in the field that people have proved that everything is fine for these theories and stuff. No, that's not true. The only thing that was actually shown is that if you consider linear disturbances around the equilibrium, so I'm talking about like Fourier physics, omega is a function of K, um, these things are actually are fine. And so, but the key point is that linear stability around the equilibrium does not imply to you know, to actually getting the good properties in the non-linear regime, okay, and that's a very important point. And what we did here was actually to try to establish these things. And for this particular case, where the only thing that we have is bulk viscosity, we were actually able to prove several things. We proved actually a couple twice in the equations. We were actually prove, able to prove that causality can be made to hold in the full non-linear regime. The theory is strongly hyperbolic, so you can also use that to prove uh, well poseness. And actually the, the, the equation is very simple in that case. However, now, you know, of course we know that bulk viscosity is not just the only thing that is there. These equations are more complicated. They have shear, they have the heat and they have things like that. So, oh, wait, let me go back. 
we try to do, yeah, we try to do the same for the case um, where um, trying to extend these claims about stability and causality in the non-linear regime, including just shear, okay? So is Israel's steward theory with shear viscosity. So the equations get very complicated, but we were able to find a few results. The results that we found, um, we were not able to do something so cool as before, because before for the theory that I showed and also for the first order, everything that we prove is if and only if. Here, we were not able to do it. This was uh, shown in this paper in 2021. We were able to find sufficient conditions that ensure causality in the nonlinear regime and necessary conditions, but we could not find the sufficient and necessary. So actually, what the only thing we were able to provide, and it was, I would say it was already a big deal because these equations are extremely hard to do anything in the nonlinear regime. So what people started to think about is, okay, fine. So let me look at these necessary conditions. I mean, you see that the thing is nasty and it's highly nonlinear, okay? Because uh, the presence of the flow or the dissipative quantity actually enters in the equation. So it's very complicated, but at least systematic, it's, you one can check. Um, and they have checked the necessary conditions. And look at this. This is what happens, for example, in heavy ions. You could ask, oh, people have solved these equations in heavy ion collision? Of course, without knowing these conditions, right? And of course, as you know, in physics, uh, we ask, it's always better ask, uh, to ask for forgiveness, uh, forgiveness, not for permission. So you solve this thing and, oh, you know, it fits the data, so it must be fine. Let's actually see what happens. I mean, it would be pretty strange and it would not be that great if in our simulations, our state of the art simulations, some of at least these necessary conditions are violated. Well, this is what happens. Um, this is shown in this paper here uh, in 2022. So this is a state of the art, um, the very famous type of initial condition. It's called ipiglasma, right, in the field, right? Uh, and this is how they start hydrodynamics. And, and the, the, the color scheme here is the following. A causal means things that violate causality because they violate the necessary conditions. Purple means the, the cells at that point uh, did not violate the necessary, but also did not satisfy the sufficient, while causal mean, or blue means that it satisfied the sufficient. So we know for sure the blue is good. This is an initial condition for the energy density of the carbon plasma. It's called epiglasma and evolved with the music code. Um, so, so you see what is the initial state? Right? Right. It's completely a causal, it's, it's as bad as it can get. Um, of course, okay. Uh, QCD is causal. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with QCD. The issue is that it could be that in heavy ions, we are, at least for this particular choice of parameters and initial conditions and transport coefficients, it could be that um, the hydrodynamics is not really the thing to do precisely at these very, very short times after the collision. Okay. So maybe if you started later or if you had different transport coefficients, uh, this thing would be better. So you see, as time evolves, then things get better because the dissipative quantities get smaller, right? Because the system is expanding back. Uh, but yeah, so we are sort of living the aftermath of this. Um, so now people are aware, the practitioners, uh, the practitioners are aware of this. And um, a lot of people are seeing what you can do. Like, how could this affect this extraction of transport coefficients? Um, how could this affect how you actually solve the equations? One thing that I can tell you is that it's not a numerical thing. It's not because the code is bad or, you know, the numerical algorithm is bad. That, that doesn't seem to be the case. I think uh, there are, of course, issues as it happens in any numerical algorithm, but that's not it. This is really a physical thing. Is that uh, it is really, really far from equilibrium here. So this will have to be figured out. So, so when I look at your gradient expansion, right? Um, yes. Um, I mean, th these guys don't, don't go very far beyond it, right? They just throw this Israel Stewart uh, relaxation condition on top of it. Uh, and they not terribly scared about otherwise doing a gradient expansion. Um, so if you were to try the same thing in, in your context, uh, how far can you push it? Yeah, that's a great question. That's exactly what we're doing now. 
um, we are trying to check this. There is one technical thing that is pretty interesting that may make a difference actually. Um, so when do we derive these conditions for causality? Uh, one thing that happens in Israel Stewart theory, and maybe I can try to, sh sh it's kind of hard here, but, oh, okay, actually this is good. So this is one of the conditions, this is just for bulk, but you get the idea. So you see what happens in order to establish these things, not only you need quantities that are defined in equilibrium like these, or like the bulk viscosity that in principle is a function of the density or the chemical potential, stuff like that. But you see in Israel Street theory, you also depend in order to establish these properties, you also depend, you have to look at what happens to the dissipative field itself. So this is cool, right? Because not only constrains the transport coefficients, but actually constrains how far from equilibrium we can be for this to make sense. Okay. Now, if you go back um, to the other formulation, um, this is actually not really the case because these variables are never really, um, so if you technically, if you compute this thing called the principal part, the thing that you use to compute the, the characteristics, all, for example, look at these conditions. These conditions here involve only quantities that are computed in equilibrium. So densities and transport coefficients. So um, it could be that the landscape is gonna look different. However, there's no free lunch. No, I mean, I may have done something cool here and then there is this also, but if the system is very far from equilibrium, the badness is gonna show up, okay? So um, there is- I would just expect that the gradients start growing like crazy and you definitely lose your expansion. Yes. Yeah. So probably what it could happen, you know, and this this can happen in theory is that uh, maybe these conditions are not going to be violated. But if you actually plot things like, you know, the deviation with respect to equilibrium is as big as the as, as the equilibrium itself. So even though formally or mathematically the equations don't break down, you should not really trust it. But you see, this is not a problem of the theory <laughs> It's a problem of the system. The system may be really too far from equilibrium. Um, and at least in the high collisions. Yeah. You have the yeah. high collisions. There are definitely two questions, right? One is are the, are the equations causal? Uh, are, are, are they well defined? Um, and the other one is do they map on the physical system? Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's exactly the point. And for heavy ion collisions, I don't think this is clear for anyone. It is not just either these equations or Israel Stewart, I mean, the system may be too far from equilibrium um, to be really high, at least, I mean, maybe in the initial state, maybe if you go, if you change some parameters and you go later, you start a bit, a little bit later, then things are better and we don't have to worry so much. But it, this is something that we have to think about. So, um, but for neutron stars, I don't think that's the case. For neutron stars, I think this thing here in particular, we don't expect deviations from equilibrium to be large. So I think this will work like a charm. So what? For me, right? I mean, I, I I like the notion that you you find a way of extending, right? Uh, but it sounds like scheme dependence in a sense for for your thermodynamic parameters as you move away from equilibrium where they are not uh, defined in, the, in in a simple way, right? Uh, with the choices that you still have available uh, in your in in your coefficients. Uh, so this is one thing. So. What, what, what is not totally clear in my mind is that if I, how I separate this from the gradient expansion itself, right? Uh, in, as in, uh, can I still make sense of this physical, well, okay, can I still make sense of mapping temperatures, uh, mapping our temperatures and other things in a non-equilibrium system? non-equilibrium system and how that relates to the convergence of your of your expansion well I, I think you could still do it but the 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 point is that i don't think it was ever correct before the simple mapping that we had before by you know throwing away these things this was never yeah, accepted that, that, that was, yeah. yeah i think that's the point so now yes <laughs> basically uh uh we still have an infinite freedom like these coefficients, as long as they satisfy those inequalities, you could still shift them and do whatever you want. Um, so that's yeah. like, like a yeah. scheme difference, right? You would get different values for your temperatures, for your chemical potentials, uh, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I'm dealing with these, uh, but, that's, but that 
doesn't hurt you because well one is as physical as the other right as soon as you say which scheme you're in you're good you're, you're good yeah you're good. yeah yeah exactly 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 so you, but if you uh, say go to second imagine you go to second order right then of course you fiddle with what your definition are, right because you have well more little friendly conflicts floating about that of course then you again have to repeat your argument and figure out which values are yeah real. yeah we and, and i can tell you yeah um we're still waiting for the brave soul who will do that <laughs> uh, yeah because as you can see things will get very complicated um but in principle in principle it could be done um so it's it's uh it's 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 an interesting it's an interesting point right so for example, one thing that I talk to people that solve these equations numerically, right? So I'm not really a numerical person. I am the one that thinks about these theories. Um, so but I, I was just talking to Franz a month ago. So I went there to give a talk and stuff. And then Franz was you know, interested in this, but he was like, okay, how do you prune your system? Like, how do you make sure? So you see, um, you, um, of course, you have to regulate the, the theory or use a good definition, but you also want to make sure that the physical predictions don't depend on these particular choices. So, and of course, hydrodynamics is a highly nonlinear theory. When you, you know, create some initial state, you are switching on all of these degrees of freedom that appear. So, of course, my standard answer is, of course, you know, as uh, you know, I put my effective theory hat and say, in the regime of validity of the theory, the effect of these regulators will be minimal, and then you're good. But what is this regime of applicability? I mean, I don't know. We have to see, we have to solve it and compare, checking things, seeing when corrections are large or small. And that's what people are starting to do. And uh, they actually did a little bit in these examples. Uh, we did a little bit in very controlled cases. But um, yeah, it's... Um, it's a general problem uh, that that I don't know yet how to solve, but I'm at least to, yeah, I'm yeah. just trying to get a feel for the state of the art here. I'm not, no, no criticism. Exactly. Yeah. So this is terribly hard. I mean, this is. Uh, yeah, of course, it's hard in any theory, right? It's hard in any theory. What is the true regime of validity of uh, any effective theory? Say, oh, of course. I mean, I have the cutoff. The cutoff is in the boondock somewhere. My, I'm describing my physics here, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, will will have recognized the word boondocks from a, a common old friend that we have. Um, so this, uh, you know, the, the cutoff is here, and then we do this physics here, and then, of course, we try to compute physics that is not really sensitive to this cutoff, right? And in, in, in quantum field theory, this is, you know, normally pretty good, because you do, you know, some diagrams and compute, you know, well, as, long you only, as long as you only play by logarithms, right, you... Uh, you, you need yes. a long range to, to contaminate stuff. Uh, exactly, exactly. And here, that's not obvious to me, right? That's, that's, that's yeah, so there is one thing, though, that is pretty interesting. Um, so the degrees of freedom that appear in this system, okay, so now let's simplify it. Let's go to the linear regime around the equilibrium. Linear regime around the equilibrium, you would see modes, collective modes, omegas as a function of K, right? And there are degrees of freedom. Those, the standard ones are the, we call the hydro modes. Those are the ones where K, when K goes to zero, omega goes to zero, like a sound wave or a diffusion uh, wave. Um, those guys are, it's really cool. They are contaminated, you would say, by this UV physics that I'm regulating, but only to higher orders. So the so hydro modes in your gradient expressions. Yes, the hydro modes look the same, but there are new, faster, non hydrodynamic degrees of freedom. So there are things where the omega stays finite. Uh, and non-zero when k goes to zero, even for homogeneous systems, but they just decay. So in principle, if you are in very smooth things where, you know, where first order theory is supposed to work, the influence of these higher order modes should be small. Of course, the problem is the theory is nonlinear. Yeah. I don't know how to prune it. That's the point. But I don't think anybody does in general. So um, we are we are sort of at that stage, at least in the theory part. The numerical part, people are solving it, and they are trying to understand how it works. Very cool. So I kind of want to follow up, taking a bit of a the chair's prerogative, um, where maybe you answered this and I just didn't get it quite yet. Um, but I know that there's been all this work trying to do systematic expansions and finding all the various transport coefficients, grads, moment analysis, this DNMR stuff. Yes. Um, 
And somehow that's different from what you're doing here. And if I did yes. I understand you correctly that what those analyses did was introduce new dynamical variables in terms yes. of yeah. So you just kept the, the dynamical variables the same. And yes, so yes. it seems to me like your approach is the more fundamental approach. Is that the right way to think about it? If I put you in the awkward position of you know, judge other people's work. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm part I'm part of this other people's work. So I can judge whatever I want. <laughs> I work <laughs> everywhere. So I can I and I, I'm I'm known for criticizing my own work pretty nicely. Okay, so um the point is the following. The philosophy is different, as you said. Um so their uh, their approach, uh, which I think is really truly awesome, and I've used that many times, you start from something like uh, that's the top-down approach, right? So you start from kinetic theory which of course you make a huge assumption here. You're assuming that kinetic theory is valid. And if you're not talking about this error, um, I would have serious serious doubts to see that kinetic theory is actually valid for the parts that we're considering heavy ion collision, but that's fine. So the point is that you start from a relativistic Boltzmann equation, and instead of writing or trying to solve the Boltzmann equation itself, you decompose this uh, thing into a bunch of moments, just like for any distribution, you can, uh, instead of just solving for the distribution itself, if you know every single moment of the distribution, in principle, you can reconstruct the distribution itself. So what they do, they create an infinite set of equations of motion for the, the, the moments of the Boltzmann equation. And of course, there's no free lunch. This thing is extremely complicated. You have an infinite uh, hierarchy of equations. And in order to solve this, you have to make some coarse graining assumption. That's where the effective theory comes in. This is, of course, this is known for decades. I mean, this is like, you know, 100 years people have been doing this in the non-relativistic regime. Isner and Stewart did this in the relativistic regime. The novelty from DNMR was to invent a nice systematic way to truncate those high order equations for the moments. Um, and that's what they call the inverse Reynolds expansion. So basically it's a better and more systematic way to throw away stuff and create a set of differential equations just for, you know, for the standard variables that you want, not only temperature, chemical potential and flow, but also pi mu nu or pi as independent variables. So that's why it naturally leads to this idea of Israel Stewart that, you know, solve more variables and then you see how it works. Um, that's what those yeah. theories are. Right. And um, there is something interesting about that. So, of course, you have to assume that the Boltzmann equation makes sense for your system. So, for example, if the system is really strongly coupled and there are no covered particles, that is an issue. Uh, and the other thing is that you don't know if this coarse grain scheme is good. It, it seems to be very good, but there could be corrections. Um, and the other thing, which I think it's interesting, is that this real, uh, the fact that you rely on the existence of kinetic theory and things like that. Um, makes it systematic, but also restrictive, okay? For those particular systems where that type of theory makes sense. Um, so, but on the other hand, this thing here, for this thing here, I don't assume any of that, okay? I don't need to. I'm just saying that if the thing exists and it's supposed to behave like a fluid, at least in a very precise and systematic way, which is again, limited, I'm talking about things uh, where the disturbance from equilibrium, I mean, this is not supposed to describe super far from equilibrium physics, uh, at least in the sense of effective theory. If you are in the regime of defective theory, the answer is this. So I don't think this is going to change. Um, in that sense, it's fine. So you could do strongly coupled, weakly coupled, because you see the difference is that here, we are not modeling the UV. We are looking at the infrared. And of course, the UV influences the infrared by coefficients, by doing some stuff, but we are creating effective theory for the infrared. And while in these other approaches, they believe, or it will be the idea that the pi mu nu itself is part of the infrared, right? So you're making a choice of the modeling. So you could say in a sense of effective theory that those Israel Stewart theories are a particular UV completion of this theory. But as in happens in most UV completions, it's not unique. While you know you could have very different UV theories, in the infrared, it will look like this. And in fact, Will, we actually derived this theory from kinetic theory. So we know how to do that from kinetic theory now too. So this is something I did with Gabriel, who is the person that teaches me kinetic theory every day. So it's... Um, 
I, I think that's that's the way I see it currently. Thank you. That that straightened out a couple. Yeah, that was great. So I, apparently, I need to I'm about to run out of battery power. I think you also need to take your kids. To yes, school. I, at some point, my kids have to go to school. So. Yeah. <laughs> You know, these kids. So just very briefly, just so I understand, so all of these various coefficients here, should I think about those as transport coefficients that could be determined from experiment? Okay. Um, the shear and bulk viscosity and stuff, yes. The other ones, no. Those are more like uh, how you parametrize your ignorance in the UV. So if you are doing this in the regime of validity of the theory, it, it should be such that these guys should not matter. Yes, that's the point. Okay. So and it's then, basically like you don't want to measure your UV cutoff when you're doing your effective theory. Right. Yes. Very good. Okay. So so we're going to be very excited to see uh, how this turns out. And hopefully you can come back and talk to us uh, again with an update. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, once more. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And uh, have a nice day there. Uh, it's almost done. I, I guess you're already in the afternoon. <laughs> okay. Exactly. You. With yes. this guy. Something like this. Exactly. Super. Yes. George. Very good. See you later, Will. Bye bye.